Welcome to Health Talk. Today we have with us Dr. Julia Shalesko from the Wound Care Center and Hyperbaric Oxygen Center affiliated with Good Samaritan Hospital in San Jose, California. Today's topic is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Who needs it? And um, so first, what is hyperbaric oxygen therapy? So hyperbaric oxygen therapy is a modality to superoxygenate the blood and at our center, we use it to help patients heal their wounds. So when you mean super oxygenate the blood, um, tell us what that means. So I have some diagrams here that uh, better explain it. So actually, the patient, um, if they have certain criteria of wounds, uh, we ask them to come in and they're placed in a chamber and I can switch to the slide where at our site we have two chambers uh, the patient comes in and they have to be absolutely clean. We tell them to come as you were at birth. That means no lotions, deodorant, hairspray, no makeup. They're on a gurney and this gurney slides right into this chamber and they're breathing 100% oxygen. So the slide will show a chamber where a patient would then slid in like a bed. This is sort of like Michael Jackson's dream bed, mm -hmm. but uh, it's except it's for wounds yes. and non-healing wounds. Yeah. Well, he actually got treated for his scalp burn wounds when he had that uh, catastrophe during his show. So he actually was in one um, for, for, a while. His, wow. for the burn injury he sustained. Yeah. Um, so now about hyperbaric oxygen. So people are placed in this chamber and oxygen is uh, being pumped in mm -hmm. through a flow system. Mm -hmm and how long are they treated for each time for this non-healing wound? Like for example, let's go over non-healing wounds, that, wounds that don't heal mm -hmm. for four to six weeks. Diabetics are more prone to it because they have bad circulation. Cigarette smokers, uh, crush injuries, or where there is no oxygen, they are just crush injuries. Uh, so a patient comes in and they get evaluated and, and uh, your center deems it necessary to have this. So they come in, how long would they be in this chamber? Um, so to, let me start off with the chamber part. So uh, they come in, they're breathing 100% oxygen and then we start to pressurize this oxygen. So we bring it to what we say to atmospheric pressure, which is equivalent to a scuba diver diving 33 feet below sea level. So it's a little bit of high pressure. Yes. And higher oxygen than normal. Correct. And they're there for an hour? So they're there for 90 minutes. So it takes to get them to depth at the pressure we want them to, it takes about 10 to 15 minutes. Then they're there for 90 minutes. And during those 90 minutes, they either can take a nap, they can uh, watch TV. They usually bring a Netflix movie and they watch it during that time. And we have a slide of that as well if they'd like to show that. Um, so, and then it takes about 10 to 15 minutes to get back up to normal pressure. And we have uh, criteria, so if you're in for a diabetic foot wound, we, we start off with 30 treatments, and then we check every 10 treatments how that patient's doing until they heal. Uh, if it's a bone infection, then we start off with 40 treatments. If it's preservation for flaps and grafts, then we'll start off with, with 20. And uh, when they're in the chamber, this is what's uh, happening. So this is a normal circulation. This is a blood vessel, and you can see all the red blood cells, and the yellow is the plasma that uh, the red blood cells are bathed in. And red blood cells have the job of bringing oxygen to the tissue. So you can see it's going there, and it's flowing into the tissue, and that's how we nourish our tissue. So then you have a patient who has a difficult wound. Uh, so usually it's because of a circulation issue, crush injury, uh, could be burns. Um, so here's an obstruction. Maybe they have arterial disease. The red blood cells come in, but it can't get past that obstruction. So all the oxygen diffuses into the area up here, but if your wound's down here, it's not getting the oxygen. So what hyperbaric oxygen does want this, is now they're bringing this pressurized oxygen, we're forcing oxygen to dissolve into the plasma. We increase it nine and a half times than what we're breathing right now. 
So the plasma is the yellow part. Correct. That's the fluid that bathes the red blood cells. Yes. So when you shake down a test tube of blood, that's the straw-colored fluid that's on top. So yes. the bottom pellet are the red blood cells. That's the straw-colored fluid, and that's the plasma. So now you're increasing the oxygen, and you're trying to get more of this healthy healing process. Yes. So again, you still have that obstruction. The red blood cells can only get to that obstruction. But the plasma is oxygenated. It could bypass that obstruction and get to the wound. And now the wound gets the oxygen. It also improves delivery of antibiotics. So if the patient's taking antibiotics, that wound can now see it. It also stimulates your stem cells. It stimulates your growth factors. It stimulates collagen. And that high tension of oxygen also kills certain bacteria. So now we have um, are able to treat these wounds. And then, go ahead. After 15 treatments, the body senses this high tension of oxygen. It starts to make new blood vessel growth. So now there's new blood vessels going around and it's bypassing this obstruction and that's how we've gotten these wounds to heal. So it's getting the oxygen in the plasma as well as new blood vessel growth and that's what really works with these patients particularly of radiation injury. Their tissue so damaged. Their, the quality of the tissue gets better once they receive this treatment. Oh this is outstanding. So how long has uh, this, ch uh, this center been open in San Jose? this area? Um, it's been open since 2010 and we have two chambers and um, I've just seen some exciting results. I had an uh, elderly patient who was about 87 years old, horrible vascular disease to the point that there was nothing else that the vascular surgeon can offer her and we do some preliminary tests and she was minimal, like no circulation whatsoever, multiple wounds on her toes and this was the last ditch effort. So. I put her in there for 40 treatments, and she's like at 10. You want it greater than 40 on a measurement scale that we have. Um, but she, at least it was something. And then I did another 10, and then she'll bounce into the normal range. But it was amazing to watch her improve uh, with these series of treatments. She had swollen feet, the swelling went down, her foot actually felt warm. Still difficult to feel a pulse, but it's just amazing what hyperbaric oxygen therapy can do. Now, was she diabetic and a smoker? She wasn't a smoker. She just had the bad luck of bad Probably. genes and peripheral vascular disease, which means um, clogged arteries. Wow, that's impressive. Yes. Was she um, elderly? She was elderly. She was 87 years old. And so many people would not have want, would have operated on her anyway. They would have... Yeah, she had... Um, some dementia and some other uh, issues. Uh, I believe she had some cardiac issues, but she already had some procedures to her legs, and so they looked at what they had to work with, and it there wasn't much. So it's excellent that this uh, wound center and hyperbaric oxygen center could really help her. Now, mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, let's say, crush injury, where the blood mess blood vessels are all macerated, all mm -hmm. crushed, and just you know, entangled and not normal. So here it would be something like this, where there's no oxygen going to some Correct. place, and so you ultimately want it to go to this. Yes. Where you're getting other um, bypasses to get there. Yeah, you're encouraging the blood, the body to create those new blood vessels. So that's outstanding. So in for crush injuries, like for a young, healthy adult in a car accident or something, how many treatments does that take? Again, it's probably different I for everybody. Would, you know, I would probably start them off with 20 to 30 treatments, but we can stop it at any time. Once that wound is healed, we could stop the session. So it's a commitment. It's Monday through Friday, two hours a week. And they still get the benefit even over the weekend because once that body's senses that high oxygen tension. It's like flipping on a light switch. It stimulates what they call the nitric oxide synthetase system, and they still get the benefit of that treatment uh, so, over the week. So it's Monday through weekend. Friday, two mm -hmm. hours a day. Correct. And then, um, and they're in this chamber, and so 90 minutes is the oxygen. You have like the 15 minutes of prep time for yes. it to get to a certain um, uh, pressure. Yes. And then I guess you have to decrease the pressure to taper it as they... And yeah, and then it, it takes a slow 
you, you go slow down and then also slow up. So they don't get the bends or something like that, like in divers? Um, usually it's the ear issues that we worry about. You have to be able to e equalize your ears as you're going down. So that's why we have a safety officer always next to these two chambers so they can uh, monitor these patients. So if a patient's having difficulty clearing their ears, they stop the, uh, the pressurization, they can back it off. They can then proceed when the patient's ready. So we tell them to pinch their nose, blow out until you can feel the popping in your ears. And they have to do that very slowly. So you don't want any ear injury. Occasionally we've had a couple of patients who, because of elderly or they've been radiated in this area, they can't open up that eustachian tube. So we'll send them to an ear, nose, and throat doctor and they can put mer uh, what they call meringotomy tubes. They put tubes oh. in the eardrums and then it automatically equalizes. And then they can continue their treatment. Now, of the patients who get this treatment, um, you know, people who get carbon monoxide poisoning, crush injuries, uh, necrotizing bacteria yes. like, you know, uh, streptococcus. Tell us what other patients. Uh, de definitely the number one patient that gets in there are the diabetic patients who have a significant infection that's down to tendon, uh, muscle, or bone and they are um, at high risk for amputation and again we really want to prevent this amputation so we throw everything at these patients that means vascular assessment you want to treat them with antibiotics for any infection and then you want to get oxygen to that area as soon as possible because once they have that amputation their um, quality of life and life expectancy is worse than someone who's had breast cancer or lung, um, colon cancer now, also, this hyperbaric oxygen therapy is good for people radi after radiation Correct. and non-healing wounds, breast cancer, uh, melanoma, uh, big skin grafts yes. that don't heal properly. Um, so how, how young do you take the patients and what's your uh, oldest patient? Right. This week I saw a 100-year-old lady. She didn't go to hyperbarics, so. Mm -hmm. um, I can't tell, I would say probably the youngest was probably in the 20s who actually went in this chamber. Um, we, at our site, we can see people as young as 16, uh, but I haven't had anyone that young that needed this uh, mode of therapy yet. Now, what are uh, the worst complication that, you know, you mentioned to me in the newspaper that in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber? Yes, I believe it was in Florida. Um, and I'm gonna go back, when we say the patient has to come in clean, we really mean clean, that means no, you don't want anything flammable in there, so you don't want any lotions, deodorants, hairspray, makeup. Um, and the center was treating this child, um, it may have been for cerebral palsy or some illness that we don't treat for. There's not much um, science to back that up. And so they had a grandmother holding the baby uh, in this chamber and so the she mom, too had to have nothing on her. Correct, yeah, so they were, they're both wearing cotton gown and she felt sorry for the child so she snuck in a toy with that child and then the chamber uh, exploded. So that's the worst complication so we really um, monitor our patients carefully and, and make sure that they understand the rules of being in these chambers. Wow, that's impressive to have something explode. Um, now what happens in most uh, normal situations, you have your cha your hyperbaric oxygen chamber center is open nine to five, or what are the hours? Um, we're op uh, our patients show up at seven thirty to be ready to go into the chamber at eight a.m. and I've stayed even to six p.m. on certain patients who really needed to be treated. But technically, we finish our treatments about four thirty. And then, and so you're Monday through Friday, mm -hmm. uh, and these are pre-scheduled in the sense that you wouldn't take emergency patients. We've had emergency patients, that's not typical, but they are scheduled. You have your eight o'clock slot, and that's, you know, the time you, you come. Uh, we've and they've been pre-assessed before, to correct. know. Yes. yes. And you also probably get referrals since we're the only one here in San Jose. The other one is regional and one is at O'Connor. Um, well, uh, O'Connor has a chamber. Uh, regional has a wound care center, but no hyperbaric oxygen chambers. Okay. So then um, you get referrals who then go through your normal wound assessment mm -hmm. and then 
uh, they're recommended for this type of therapy. Yeah. Uh, the patients who may not need uh, wound treatment or assessment by us, but we still do a physical exam, are those who have uh, radiation injury to the jaw. So we're working with the oral facial maxillary surgeon where maybe they had tonsillar cancer or maybe uh, cancer of the mandible. Unfortunately, that area gets radiated and the circulation to the jawbone gets compromised. They don't have enough. And then you look in their mouth and you can actually see the jawbone being exposed. So we have a treatment plan where we'll treat them, get their tissue ready uh, for a certain amount of treatments. They then go back to oral facial maxillary surgeon, maybe for a debridement or a flap closure. They come back to us and we make sure that flaps arise. Wow. So it's a long process of assessment and reassessment mm -hmm. and constant kind of vigilance about this patient and wound care. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you was that in, in this type of situation, uh, what has been your most heroic outcome, the most, the happiest ending? It wasn't quite a happy ending, but it was very hero heroic. Uh, there was a young woman, I want to say she was about 32, she went wakeboarding and she got slammed down into the water. She doesn't remember how she fell. She goes to a neighboring hospital and uh, they take an x-ray of her ankle, take an x-ray of her knee. They can't figure out you know, where her pain's coming from. They put her in a new mobilizer, but one thing they did notice was she had decreased sensation on part of her leg. And you could see all the pin marks of where they tried to figure out why she couldn't feel. So they assumed it was a nerve injury. Uh, that happened on a Friday, and then they said, please follow up with an orthopedic doctor the following day. I don't know how this woman tolerated it, but she went through the whole weekend, sees the orthopedic doctor on Monday, and she has a black foot. She gets sent to the ER, and what they figured must have happened was that her knee dislocated backwards, so she injured the artery to uh, the back of her leg, and her circulation was compromised, so she had emergent surgery, and Good Samaritan Hospital was so um, really outstanding in that they sent her from ICU in an ambulance to our center uh, every day, and I believe it was even twice a day, to try to save as much of her leg as possible. Wow, that's impressive yes. that modern therapy can, you know, save gangrene. This is like battle stories. Um, in, in also in your wound center, who's your uh, youngest uh, patient for this hyperbaric uh, chamber therapy? I think I saw, I want to say he was maybe 20 years old, and this was another case that Good Samaritan Hospital was very nice, sending the patient over by ambulance. Uh, he was an IV drug abuser, took Oxycontin, crushed it, injected it, and apparently got the artery, and so all his fingers had turned black. They did multiple procedures trying to save his um, hand, and so he was shipped to us uh, to try to uh, salvage as much of his fingers as possible. So recreational drug use has its <laughs> yes. hazards. Yes, <laughs> so that was the youngest. Um, the other thing that the home audience may want to know about is that in the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, you know, it's now commonplace. People talk about buying their own oxygen canisters, taking it to the plane and that people are using it for healthy living and wellness. Mm -hmm. Can you comment about that? Well, at our center, we follow strictly Medicare guidelines, so we only treat patients um, who, who have wounds and are very strict. But there is a center down the street from us. It's a standalone center, and if you have enough money, you can be treated. So I. I so the off-label uses. Correct. So there'll be athletes or maybe parents who have children who have autism or cerebral palsy who feel like, let me give my child anything they can get to see if they can improve. So the off-label uses have included Alzheimer's, yes. um, the Lou Gehrig's disease, the amyotrophic lateral mm -hmm. sclerosing disease, the neurodegenerative uh, disease, um, and uh, other uh, like cerebral palsy. Yeah, also concussion. They started doing studies on that. Nothing's proven with that, but that's another uh, thing they're trying to see if they, they're looking at. Can we uh, decrease the severity of concussion, or particularly if they've had a second one? And uh, I'm sure the jury is not in on that because the FDA has yes. not approved that. Right. Um, but there is growing popularity among 
uh, lay audience, uh, you know, through various health magazines or whatever. Uh, how has it helped people with au uh, autism? Have they tried enough people? Tried it enough uh, people? I there's not enough science to support that. Um, but people although are trying. Although I did have a hyperbaric oxygen safety officer who was with me, who was at a center who treated autistic children. He felt that there was an improvement. Uh, when I read uh, some comments online, some parents were saying, "I don't think it helped." Some say, "Yeah, I think it did." So. And it's, yeah. it's very subjective. And autism is such a broad range anyway. Okay. It's not one diagnosis and with one cause. There are many mm -hmm. reasons why people mm -hmm. have autism. Now, it's very interesting for radiation therapy, you know, for people mm -hmm. who've had radiation for cancer and their skin is abnormal, um, that the hyperbaric oxygen has helped these people yes. with healing and burns, that it really has significantly improve their ability to cl skin to close mm -hmm. before they would have large openings in their arms or their torso or their neck. Um, I'm sure in the last four years you're seeing increasing referrals. Has that been true? Yes, we have. And are, are more people sending you patients word of mouth or is still more physician referral? I'm probably going to say still more physician referral, although um, we've had, I told my neighbor or I told my friend, so we get a few of those. And also the home health service have been really impressed with our center, so they may be already taking a p care of a patient at home, and they'll say, oh, this doesn't look good. Why don't you go to um, our wound care center? So that's a good referral base. Uh, we do have a good relationship with some primary uh, physicians who automatically see a wound or you know, and they send them to us. So mostly surgeons would refer to you. Is that true, or family um, practitioners and internal I medicine? I would probably say more family practitioners because they definitely don't want to do with the with the wounds. Uh, surgeons have the capabilities. Do you know? And is this going to be a, a lengthy time for them to heal these patients in the wound? It's really not convenient for them to see this patient on a weekly basis when they can be seeing other consults or seeing other patients. So. Uh, they may see them a, a few times and say, this is going to be a long process. Let me give them to the wound care center because we do have uh, products, um, skin substitute agents, and other things that are more available to us than to them to heal these wounds. Now, when people go through for the hyperbaric oxygen therapy, um, what other things do they do after their two hours with you? What other things they must do to do for wound care? Well, we is definitely it, tell them not to smoke. <laughs> um, we really counsel our patients, our diabetic patients, they really have to get their sugars under control because high blood sugar is uh, injurious to the, the tissue and it actually kind of defeats our aggressiveness in healing them, so we tell them to eat properly. Um, we do take their vital signs and blood sugar before they go into the chamber and then afterwards because it's interesting when they're in the chamber their blood sugar will drop sometimes quite significantly. So we make sure that they're in an appropriate range to make sure that when they come out of the chamber, they're still okay. Oh, so now um, all of this is done in the uh, 15 minutes before they go into the chamber or it's done like the day before? Uh, no, the... we check them every day. Oh, we check them? We okay. check their blood sugars and their vital signs every day before going in. So we make sure that their blood pressure is appropriate, that their blood sugar is okay before going into these chambers. So let's say you're a diabetic patient with a non-healing foot ulcer and you mm -hmm. go in the hyperbaric oxygen chamber. Um, let's say after the two-hour session at your center, do they have specific uh, wound instructions like peroxide or betadine or whatever, mm -hmm. wet to dry? What do you tell them or depends on the, the wound? Um, we will group their wound care visit with their hyperbaric uh, time. So if they have a 12 o'clock slot, we'll see them at 11.30. So we'll evaluate the wounds, they get packaged up, and then they go into the uh, hyperbaric oxygen therapy or vice versa. But their wound care management is usually once a week. So they already have a set of instructions that carries them through the week. Uh, but every day they're going into the hyperbaric chamber. If there's any issues with um, drainage or with their dressings, we immediately take them out. We'll reserve a room for them and we'll evaluate them for whatever issue there may be. And also there's home health services. Correct. So we have about three minutes remaining. We want to tell our home audience um, 
what's the take home message for hyperbaric oxygen therapy? Tell us, what do you want the home audience to remember? Well, particularly if you're a diabetic and you have a wound on your foot, you are at risk for amputation, and this is one of the modalities to help you heal. Uh, and again, this is in conjunction with antibiotics, wound debridement, and this is an adjunctive therapy, uh, an accessory treatment to get you to have prevent the worst possible thing, which would be amputation. Um, and you want them to get to a point where they're creating new blood vessels. Correct. So we want them this way instead of this way where there is not enough yes. oxygen on one side of this wound. The, um, yeah, the other people I would like to hit would be women who have breast cancer. I mean, that's a pretty devastating surgery to have a mastectomy and radiation uh, treatment. Their tissues are really uh, injured with that. So if there's any issues, you know, they can have assistance with hyperbaric oxygen treatment, as well as patients with head and neck cancers. They get radiated. They could have bleeding gums, exposed bone. They would benefit also with this treatment. And there's not enough skin here, especially the radiation, the mandible, the mm -hmm. mandible cancer surgery to really stretch it. So they really need all the wound healing they can get because yes. it can be an open wound. Now, in um, for people at home, they should remember that skin is very important, that protects yes. everything. So once there's a break in the skin that doesn't heal four to six weeks, so the magic number is four to six weeks. Yes. If something doesn't heal four to six weeks, uh, consider complaining to your doctor and <laughs> making an appointment and then asking about wound care centers because this exists now. And if diabetes is in the picture as well, it's much more important to really get on the phone and get a doctor to see you because it can go very bad very quickly. Um, the other thing is that we want people to be um, reminded that the body's an incredibly uh, miraculous organ, that with the oxygen there is the capability of creating new blood vessels, of uh, taking something that's about to turn black mm -hmm. and getting it back to the normal pink color of, of human flesh, and that it, it doesn't have to be like your great-grandfather's old wound where everyone gets amputated. So this is modern medicine today. So thank you very much to the home audience for joining us for hyperbaric oxygen therapy and who needs it. Uh, and we could all be like Michael Jackson, live forever perhaps. <laughs> or if we have a wound and there is a medical indication that's approved by the Food and Drug Administration that wound centers and hyperbaric oxygen centers exist and to uh, call and find out about if your loved one or your best friend or your neighbor or your family member has a non-healing wound. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Julia Thank Shalesko. You,